cooking a Thanksgiving turkey or if I'm going to this local supermarket and buying turkey sandwiches. Let's see how many how many do we have on board now? I, I see my my screen is indicating I can widen out here. Yeah, twenty nine. Uh, twenty nine. Twenty nine. Oh, that's pretty good. Jeff or, the, or anybody down the Southwest chapter, one of my good friends was Hal Williams, and I all I know is that. He retired in the San Diego area. Does, does anybody know him or see him down there? No, I, uh, I haven't. Yeah, I, I made a call on him when I came back here in 99 and he was still the CEO of whatever they called it then, Spayware System Center, San Diego. And he did retire from that as far as I know. And I don't know where he ended up. I think he may even be in our chapter. It's something I could check, I guess. But I, I haven't seen him since since then. Okay, yeah, he just sort of sort of vanished. Well, good morning, uh, Bruce and everybody. Fritz Rogi here, and uh, I know we're a couple minutes early, but uh, just wanted to make sure you know I'm uh, I'm online and uh, you know, ready uh, ready whenever you guys are. And uh, you know, thanks again for the invitation. Oh, well, thank you for agreeing to speak with us, Amber. <clears throat> Yeah, we'll give it a couple of minutes and then we'll go ahead and start. So how are things in Washington, D.C. today? Uh, well, they're, uh, it's, it turns out these are interesting times in Washington, as you might imagine. Uh, but uh, it's a beautiful day, uh, which is nice. Uh, we just had a, had a pretty soggy uh, you know, holiday weekend because of the remnants of the tropical storm that was uh, passing over. Um, but uh, otherwise, it's great. And, uh, you know balmy 70 or so degrees, so not bad for uh, mid-October. Good. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm almost reluctant to ask about the weather in San Diego. I know that's almost a rhetorical question. Yeah, we're having a heat wave. We're supposed to get up uh, into the 90s downtown and hundreds inland, so. Wow, are you guys uh, getting any of the, uh, any of the smoke and uh, debris from uh, wildfires? Uh, San Diego's been lucky this time. Uh, it, pretty much everything's north of LA and to the northern part of the state. So a couple, I guess Labor Day weekend, we got a little bit of smoke well, <coughs> from the fires to the east of us, but <clears throat> they were able to contain them. So uh, it hasn't been too bad down here. Good. It's strange because uh, we had a brown cloud come over our place and then start dropping some ash out of it. And I, uh, apparently it was kind of an aberration because uh, it was an isolated uh, cloud. It wasn't part of a general cloudy season, but we were seeing some pretty red sunsets for a while. Hmm. Okay, well, it's noon, so let's go ahead and kick off the meeting. So we'll start with the um, national anthem. Hey, let's see. Has everybody got the flag in front of them? <laughs> uh, yep. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, stand up and uh, go ahead and start the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America. To the Republic. and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> so I'd like to welcome everybody to our October uh, Zoom professional ses session. Uh, this is our third Zoom, but as I heard from some of the comments before we started, everybody's getting fairly used to operating with Zoom. Um, the, of course, the, the downside is we're not able to meet in person and talk, but the upside is we're able to get Emerald Rogi from Washington, D.C. to be able to speak to us along with members from all over the country. 
And I think we actually have one of our members. Well, let's see. I want to welcome Brian Dixon from Hurricane Alley down in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Back on. And uh, all the other members from and uh, both chapter members and some league members from outside the area. Uh, today, uh, we should mark or say so. I uh, want to mark that today is the 245th birthday of the uh, U.S. Navy. So happy birthday, Navy. Uh, and, <clears throat> um, next, I want to mention that we've all been saddened by the passing of Airbolt Carl Trust, uh, a special submariner known to many of you and part of that submarine triad of Airbolt's Watkins, Kelso, and Trust, who all served as CNOs. I'm sure most of you have stories of personal contact with Admiral Trost and he will be missed. Um, see, I want to congratulate, I don't think we have him on board, uh, but uh, let me put up something. Let's see if I can do it here. Come on, where are you? Find the right graphic. Yeah, Bruce, we, we lost another good guy, too, and I, I think everybody heard about it, but uh, it was Bill Smith. Uh, uh, he passed away uh, about, uh, oh, I think about 10 days ago. Oh, okay. Where is that one? Oh, for some reason, I can't. I'll show all windows. Uh, uh, hopefully you can see the logo for the new, new submarine training facility here in San Diego. But somebody's got an echo on. Uh, but, so Steve Andrews my cousin, and I were able to end the stand-up ceremony at the Ocean View on October uh, 2nd. And uh, we want to congratulate Commander Mock. Makamaza uh, for his, uh, standing up the command. And uh, just wanted you to see a picture of the logo with the uh, USS Tang. And uh, Steve and I are both Midway docents, so it uh, warmed our heart to see uh, the Midway as part of the new logo. Let's see. Um, the uh, Submarine League is initiating a mentoring program, which will link individual members either with an active duty or younger NSL members who are interested in interacting with former submariners on professional or personal topics. Uh, our November newsletter will contain a link to a webinar about the program. And if you're interested in being a mentor or mentee, please contact me and I can get you some more details. Um, with all indications that the Ocean View will not be available until sometime in 2021, we plan to continue our Zoom format uh, hope, with a continued stellar lineup of guests from near and far. Right now, our plan for our November speaker will be Vice Admiral Daryl Cottle, uh, former ComSub PAC and now ComSub 4. Uh, and we continue to monitor the state of the COVID pandemic and continue to recommend adherence to CDC guidelines. Wear those masks, guys. Uh, please take care of yourselves and stay well. Uh, does anybody have any old business for the chapter? Anybody have any new business they want to bring up? Okay, so it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Uh, Vice Admiral Frit Frederick J. Fritz Rogge is an honors graduate of the University of Minnesota, go Gophers, with a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering and was commissioned through the Reserve Officers Training Corps program. He earned a Master of Science in Engineering Management from the Catholic University of America and a Master's of Arts with highest distinction in National Security and Strategic Survey Studies from the Naval War College. He was a fellow of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology seminar program. His sea tours include the USS Whale, SSN 638, Florida, SSBN 728 Blue, 
Key West SSN722, and he commanded the USS Connecticut SSN22. We got a tour of the Connecticut, Connecticut a couple of years ago when she came into San Diego. And she was a very impressive boat, so I'm sure that was a, a, a wonderful tour for you. Uh, his major command was as Commodore of Submarine Squadron 22 with additional duty as Commanding Officer, Naval Support Activity, La Maddalena, Italy. For sure, he has served on the staff of both the Atlantic and Pacific Submarine Force Commanders and on the staff of the Director of Naval Nuclear Propulsion on the Navy staff in the Assessments Division in 81 and the Military Personnel Plans and Policy Division in 13. In the Secretary of the Navy's Office of Legislative Affairs at the U.S. House of Representatives. Hopefully it was a little uh, more subdued when you were there than it is today. Uh, and as head of the Submarine and Nuclear Power Distribution Division Personnel 42 at the Naval Personnel Command. Also as an Assistant Deputy Director on the Joint Staff in both the Strategy and Policy J5 and Regional Operations J33 Directorates. Admiral Rogge completed his first flag officer assignment as the deputy commander, Joint Functional Component Command for Global Strike at U.S. Strategic Command in Omaha. He then served concurrently as Commander Submarine Group 8, Commander Submarines Allied Naval Forces South, Deputy Commander U.S. Sixth Fleet, and Director of Operations and Intelligence N3, and as the U.S. Naval Forces Europe Africa. He later served on the Navy staff as Director of Military Personnel Plans and Policy Division in 13, with a concurrent period as Director Total Force Manpower Division in 12, and then as Commander Submarine Force Pacific in Pearl Harbor. Admiral Rogge assumed his duties as 16th President of the National Defense University on September 25th, 2017. NDU is the University of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the premier joint professional military education institution in the Department of Defense. NDU's mission is to develop joint warfighters and other national security leaders through rigorous academics, research, and engagement to serve the common defense. The university, through its five component colleges, offers graduate degrees and certifications to over 2,000 U.S. military officers, civilian government officials, international military officers, and industry partners annually. If anybody has questions for Admiral Rogge, please submit them via the chat function in the Zoom down at the bottom, and they will be addressed after the Admiral's talk. Admiral Rogge, welcome, and we look forward to hearing the view from Fort McNair. Hey, well, thanks for that, Bruce, and uh, thanks uh, to the entire chapter for inviting me back. So uh, uh, I am also a um, you know, previously served uh, commander of the Pacific Submarine Force, and uh, on a couple of different occasions uh, during that tour, you invited me to uh, uh, to meet with the chapter. I always relish these opportunities, and, and perhaps now even more so because uh, from my uh, current locale uh, here at Fort McNair, uh, you know, hundreds of miles from the closest submarine uh, and with a mission which uh, is perhaps you know, uh, many, many more miles removed uh, from uh, uniquely the Navy's domain. Uh, I don't get to talk about, uh, you know, Navy and submarines very much anymore. So uh, this will be fun. Uh, but I will uh, intend to, uh, to uh, discuss this and kind of frame this through uh, the, uh, the, the lens of my current job at uh, National Defense University. Now, Bruce, I think that uh, uh, my staff has provided you some slides that, uh, uh, that you're going to uh, be in charge of. And if so, yeah, can I ask? Are you ready? I'm ready. Go ahead. Find out how, uh, what a technophile you are. Okay, there we go. And uh, that's, uh, that's all you need to know. That is uh, Fort McNair. Uh, uh, front and center there is the National War College. And you can see that uh, to the left 
on the horizon is the Washington Monument. Uh, to the right on the horizon is the uh, uh, is the U.S. Capitol. So uh, we have uh, 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 this is uh, the uh, U.S. Army's third oldest uh, fortification. Goes back to 1791 on a point of land, uh, basically where the Potomac and the Anacostia Rivers come together. Uh, next slide. So um, uh, when uh, CNO told me uh, he was uh, nominating me to uh, be president of National Defense uh, University, uh, my first kind of instinctive reaction was, uh, okay, what's that? Um, you know, I uh, uh, am not a graduate of uh, the institution here at Fort McNair. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I had some discovery learning to do. Um, and uh, obviously, I was not uh, hired to be a professional academic. Uh, you know, they didn't uh, you know, need me to design or deliver curriculum, um, but, uh, you know, to do what uh, naval officers do, which is you know, to try and provide direction and guidance. Uh, but uh, here, just as a kind of a quick summary of some of the things that you also might not know about uh, your National Defense University. Uh, so we have five colleges, uh, four of them here in Washington, D.C., uh, one down in Norfolk. Uh, and we also operate satellite programs at Fort Bragg and uh, at each of the combatant commanders. Um, and uh, it's a great faculty, uh, which is a combination of active duty military and some interagency professionals and then you know, civilian academics, uh, but they're all hired, the civilian academics are all hired under Title 10, you know, the same Title 10 that uh, uh, governs um, much, uh, uh, has much of the statutory uh, authority for the Department of Defense. And as a result, there is no tenure. Uh, it's a very flexible workforce. Um, and every year we graduate uh, and award uh, about 800 master's degrees from those five colleges. So five different degrees and about 800 total. Um, and between the master's degrees, uh, all of which award the joint professional military education uh, and <clears throat> also a, a shorter program that we run down in Norfolk, uh, NDU is responsible for delivering to the nation over half of all JPME-2 qualifications. And of course, you know, JPME-2 is a prerequisite of Goldwater Nichols uh, for um, officers to be uh, considered for promotion to uh, 07, to uh, become admirals and generals. So uh, it's uh, very much in demand. Um, <clears throat> our master's degrees are accredited by the same body that accredits you know, all other mid-Atlantic institutions, so Georgetown, Johns Hopkins, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, and our joint education is accredited uh, by the joint staff for the award of the JPME. And our student body, uh, I'll show you some details in a moment, but it's a mix. It, in fact, it's only about 50% of US military officers. The other 50% uh, comes from across the civilian uh, workforce of uh, US government and from uh, friends, allies, and partnered nations. Um, my, uh, my predecessor in this job was a Marine Corps Major General and his predecessor an Army Major General. So clearly it's a joint position. The, um, the services rotate through, uh, but um, although uh, in its origin, NDU was commanded by a three-star, uh, more recently, as I said, it was uh, downgraded to a two. And then General Dunford uh, decided that um, uh, you know, the span of control, scope of responsibility warranted uh, restoration. So um, I'm the first you know, three star to come back. And interestingly, my primary interlocutor on the joint staff, the J7 is also a vice admiral, uh, or an, an 09, uh, a three star. And that, uh, uh, that lash up has never existed before, which is, it makes it pretty powerful. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, we've got interagency uh, representation here. And in fact, uh, we're the preferred source of executive education for other US government departments. Uh, State Department actually is our most significant um, contributor outside of DOD. Um, I was surprised to discover that uh, in law, uh, the NDU president is a member of the board of the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, and uh, we are a, a full participant with all of my civilian counterparts here in the DC area, uh, all of whom uh, like us are uh, working through the impacts of COVID uh, while trying to deliver our, our education. 
Um, and because of that close partnership with the State Department, uh, we have uh, half a dozen ambassadors, full served ambassadors uh, in leadership positions and in our faculty across the university. Uh, and uh, you know, we do much more in contributing to uh, strategic engagement than just hosting students. You know, every year uh, I will find myself hosting uh, you know, upwards of 50 visits by you know, heads of state, chiefs of service, uh, uh, and as well as my university counterparts. So all of that was uh, you know, kind of interesting and, uh, and uh, you know, certainly got me pretty excited about the job. Uh, for the next slide, uh, just real quickly, it's just kind of a picture that kind of shows uh, you know, where we fall. So the other thing that's kind of new now is that uh, uh, the NDU president is now a direct report to the chairman, whereas it previously uh, had reported through the J7, uh, in particular when you know, NDU was a two-star and the J7 was a three-star. Um, and we, I'm fortunate now that my, uh, my partner in crime is another great submarine officer, uh, Admiral Stuart Munch, who uh, uh, just came over from the Navy staff to become the, the, J, the joint staff J7. And of course, the J7 portfolio is about developing the force. What we do in developing leaders is certainly a part of developing the force. So it's a very, very close partnership. Next slide. Uh, here's just a, a picture again of uh, kind of uh, overhead of, of the campus. Um, you know, Fort McNair, we're the primary tenant on uh, on the on the fort. Um, uh, you know, the uh, there's a, there's a couple of smaller institutions, but uh, uh, the buildings to the right of your slide are are NDU. And there you see our vision and our mission statement. I won't read them to you, but I do want to emphasize. You know, these are uh, the chairman's vision and the chairman's uh, mission statement for us about creating advantage, uh, forging relationships, whole of government, whole of nations, uh, but fundamentally then you know, narrowed down in the mission statement, we are about educating joint warfighters. Uh, and it is to prepare us to be able to conduct war uh, and hopefully through our actions to prevent the need to conduct war. Next slide. So uh, this one then uh, just kind of shows where we fit in the panoply of um, Defense Department education institutions. Um, it's, uh, so we, uh, yep, back up one more. All right, there we are. So, and, and you use, <laughs> I know it's, it's finicky, Bruce, you're doing good though. Yep. Um, so, and you use there in purple, uh, the five colleges you see from left to right, um, uh, with their degree programs. Uh, we have the Joint Forces Staff College in Norfolk. Uh, we run the capstone program for uh, one stars, keystone for senior enlisted, uh, those you know, E9s who are going off to be uh, senior enlisted of joint forces like at combatant commands, and then pinnacle for, uh, for three stars. And then obviously Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps have their own service institutions. And, and of course, uh, all of us are expected to um, uh, deliver on learning objectives that come from the chairman, uh, joint professional military education. Uh, but you know, when you go to, uh, uh, to, to Newport, you uh, appreciate the, the value and the contributions of the maritime domain. Uh, you know, I'm also a graduate of the Air Command and Staff College, where I learned that air power has been singularly responsible for every American victory, even those predating manned flight somehow. Uh, so it's appropriate that, uh, you know, each institution, uh, you know, reflects its own domain of expertise. And uh, I'd, I'd call out and ask everybody to uh, look at the chat from uh, my shipmate on board USS Florida, Professor Tad Lawrence, who's uh, now a proud uh, member of the faculty out at uh, uh, the uh, uh, Command and Staff College out in, uh, uh, at uh, Leavenworth. So Tad, nice to see you on the line here too. Uh, so anyway, but that's, so we all deliver JPME. Uh, I would then argue that our mission at NDU is to try and be the most ecumenically joint in approaching all domains of competition. Next. Next slide is just a uh, you know, quick uh, kind of review of, uh, of uh, you know, my uh, intelligence preparation of the environment, my battle space. Uh, we've got a lot of, uh, of uh, you know, very talented you know, students enabled by very talented faculty and staff. Uh, well, we have a lot of stakeholders. And obviously, you know, I work for the chairman. 
learning objectives come from the joint staff and, uh, and some from OSD. Uh, our graduates all, uh, well, 50% of our graduates go and fill joint billets at places like combatant commanders. And obviously our, our uh, military officers all come to us from the services, but also uh, from the federal agencies. And of course, the Congress has oversight. In some cases, there are statutory uh, expectations of, of, of what we do. Um, and I'd highlight on here uh, both uh, the, the partner nations and the industry you know, partners. So because, uh, uh, again, uh, we think that the, uh, what is the most valuable and in some ways uniquely valuable of what, what we deliver, uh, we are able to deliver because of a really, really broad student demographic. So with that, let's go to the next slide. Um, and so uh, the, the pie chart is almost a little too complicated. Here's all you really need to know. Um, you know. Think of it as basically six wedges and we strive for the six to be about in balance. And so if I have you know, nominally, uh, let's say, you know, well, at the bottom, we'll say 720 students um, uh, in our full-time year-long programs uh, at any given time then uh, that's six different wedges of about 120 students. And so one, half of those wedges are Army, Air Force, and Naval, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard. And so here on the slide, you see it's actually a little bit more than 50%, but uh, we strive for about 50. And then the other wedges are from uh, the department, our civilians from DOD, civilians from the rest of the interagency, and international students. Um, and this year we've got uh, about 120 international students from uh, over uh, 70 countries. Um, and so it's, we designed that demographic to be able to uh, uh, have uh, pretty robust conversations in the classrooms. Uh, I know for a fact, and in fact, I know that this audience can appreciate uh, that if you got a bunch of submarine officers together and gave them a wicked thorny problem, what kind of a solution would we come up with? It'd be a solution that required a lot of submarines. Okay, well, uh, as good as submarines are, we can't do everything. Uh, we're pretty crappy at showing the flag. We're really bad at firing warning shots. Uh, there are needs for capabilities from across the joint force. And, uh, and so we try and deliberately expose you know, all of our students to a wide variety of uh, different perspectives. Um, and perspectives that are informed from a lot of professional experience. So our typical students are, uh, is the 05, uh, maybe junior 06, uh, again, you know, early 40s and, you know, 15 to 20 years of, uh, of operational experience. And that same description kind of fits the civilians we get from, uh, def from defense, our foreign service officers from state, our international population as well. Next. We talked then a little bit about those international students and about how powerful uh, an, an impact they can have. Um, so what you see here is, um, well, first off at the bottom, you can see it's again, like I said, uh, over 120 students, over 60 countries uh, currently on our campus. Uh, but when you look at the you know, 40 years in which we've had a robust international program, what you see on the left there is it's now over 4,500 alumni from over 146 countries. And then uh, for those graduates who go on and become, you know, and, and achieve the very highest level of, uh, of a professional success in their fields, like you see with those colored stars, you know, a minister of defense, a chief of defense, a chief of service, an ambassador, you know, et cetera, um, you know, that makes them eligible uh, for recognition in our hall of fame. We actually have uh, over 150 you know, individuals who are eligible, uh, but when we induct them, we try and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, do it in an event here in Washington. And so yeah, we're, we're competing for their time to get them back here to Washington, which is why there's only half that number who have actually been inducted so far. Um, and let me just you know, say, and you can see from kind of this distribution from the heat map, you know, the, the, the colors on the chart, uh, you know, where they come from and kind of in what numbers. And you can see from the colored stars, uh, you know, the kinds of places where these folks have gone on. And this is where, you know, we have folks who are currently serving as chiefs of defense, chiefs of service, et cetera. Not, not just historical, but currently serving. So think about how powerful a tool that is, uh, you know, for the U.S. military officer or for that matter, the U.S. diplomat 
who shows up in in country needing to accomplish uh, you know, a mission and you know is is you know looking for looking for people who speak the same language, looking for allies, if you will. And uh, let me give you a quick sea story, a quick vignette on this. So uh, uh, last year I was chatting with uh, uh, one of our alums who is a, a two-star uh, general, uh, major general in the Irish Republic Army. Uh, and he had been assigned, he's a National War College grad, class of 2009. He had been assigned as the commander of the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon, UNIFIL. Uh, so he gets on the ground in southern Lebanon, walking the blue line, wondering, okay, how is my war college education going to help me preserve the peace, prevent the outbreak of the next Middle East conflict, uh, et, et cetera. Um, and uh, so he uh, yeah, starts looking around, and I'd like to take credit for this, but frankly, it's really just serendipity. Um, he looks around and discovers that in the uh, Lebanese Southern Military District, his two Brigadier General Lebanese Armed Forces counterparts, the, his primary interlocutors, uh, one is his war college classmate, the other is another NDU 2009 classmate from a different college. It looks a little further north and the uh, Lebanese Armed Forces Chief of Defense is uh, General Joseph Aoun, who is a 2006 graduate of our College of Irregular Warfare. Uh, the U.S. ambassador in Beirut at the time is Elizabeth Richards, who was his War College graduate, class of 2009. He looks south, and in Tel Aviv, the U.S. Army Defense, the U.S. Defense Attaché in Tel Aviv is his War College classmate, 2009. Uh, his Israeli Army Northern Division commander, his primary interlocutor across the Blue Line. Uh, is uh, Mickey Edelstein, who was his, you guessed it, his war college classmate. And down uh, back in Tel Aviv again, even the Israeli Minister of Defense was, is Benny Gantz, who is, yes, you guessed it, an NDU and war college graduate. So again, I'd like to take credit for orchestrating this. That would be, uh, that would be presumptive. Uh, but the reality is, you know, he was able to immediately fall in on a network of folks who not only had, you know, been educated in matters of strategy in the same kind of way, spoke the language, both the English language and the strategic language. Uh, but in many, but if they weren't already personal relationships, it was very easy to, to create personal relationships. So again, he didn't have to spend half his tour trying to develop relationships and build trust. He's able to walk in on it. And okay, you know, in fairness, you know, we did not achieve a lasting Middle East you know, permanent peace solution as a result of those efforts, but we didn't go to war. And you'll notice that in that whole you know, vignette, uh, the majority of all the, the, the principal players who are preventing an outbreak of war are not US military officers. These are friends, partners, and allies who have been brought together on our campus uh, in order to uh, you know, be able to, to benefit not only from their education, but from the relationships. So I guess it wasn't a short C story, it went on, but uh, you know, I, I find this pretty exciting stuff. So next slide. All right, so let me then segue a little bit. I mean, we are uh, in the business of developing national security professionals. So let me just kind of, these next couple of slides, I just want to kind of summarize for you, uh, you know, what really has been a pretty significant change in US strategic thinking, um, you know, in the last, just over the last three years here now. So uh, the US issued a new national security strategy, new national defense strategy, new national military strategy at the, at the start of this administration. And again, I'm not gonna read the, the slide to you, but this just kind of compares, this highlights some of the differences uh, of, or uh, highlights the, you know, the, the themes that are significant in the new strategy relative to the old strategy. Because let's face it, you know, since the you know, fall of the uh, Berlin Wall, end of the Cold War, uh, I mean, we have been very focused on uh, you know, counterterrorism operations in the Middle East, and particularly so since 911. Uh, but, but interestingly, uh, even just 20 years ago, uh, the nation's national security strategy had no mention of China. The, 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 the country was not even named. And Russia was only referred to as a potential partner and an emerging democracy. Uh, so my, how times have changed. 
So here we are 20 years later, and this security strategy is, is explicit in identifying China and Russia as existential threats, uh, you know, North Korea, Iran as uh, also as threats, and of course the ongoing challenge of, um, of, uh, of terror. Um, the strategy recognized that uh, you know, because of our uh, post-Cold War and counter-terror investments, um, you know, there's a lot of military procurement needs that uh, you know, had probably been under-resourced. And it reinforced the importance of nuclear forces. And of course, you know, we all appreciate that the, the role of our ballistic missile submarines uh, remains you know, the, most, uh, the most important leg of the nuclear triad. And we're seeing uh, you know, the, uh, in the, here in Washington, we're seeing now the nation's commitment to revitalizing, to modernizing all the legs of the triad. At, at great cost, but uh, you know, unnecessary cost because uh, you know the uh, uh, Ohio class uh, Trident missile platforms like uh, Tad and I served on are are aging rapidly. Next slide. And then the national defense strategy. So on top is kind of you know what the, the previous strategy had talked about, and on the bottom uh, again the focus on great power competition. Russia, China, uh, Iran, North Korea, counterterror. Um, and makes clear the need for modernization, makes clear the need to invest in readiness. It acknowledges that, uh, uh, that, that the future of competition and, uh, and uh, potentially conflict is not uniquely you know, maritime or air or ground or cyber. It's that all domains are being contested. And it really challenges us as Americans to, uh, to recognize, to wake up and smell the coffee that, you know, although we have enjoyed technological superiority, superiority uh, over everyone, uh, particularly for the last 30, uh, 30 years, uh, that's not our birthright, okay? Uh, we have to work hard. Uh, working hard certainly includes the investments in technology, the procurement, uh, but it also includes the human dimension that I'll talk about uh, more here, here in a moment. Uh, so let's go to the next slide then. All right. And then, you know, what does this all mean for the submarine force? Um, well, I mean, I think pretty clearly, um, I mean, what we are able to contribute uniquely is critical uh, to this competition. You know, certainly competition, should we get into actual conflict uh, because of our ability to go into denied areas, uh, bring the fight to the enemy. Uh, but frankly, it's that capability to fight and win that is the most effective deterrent as well. And we certainly see uh, competitors making significant investments trying to, uh, uh, trying to get after our technological advantage. Um, I already mentioned the uh, uh, SSBN leg of the triad. Um, and uh, I already kind of touched on that, uh, that middle bullet as well. So again, having that, uh, that credible capability, which remains unmatched is you know, not only key to win, but because it's key to our ability to win, it's, uh, it's the most powerful deterrent that we have. Uh, next slide. Okay, um, so then what does it mean in the, uh, for my, now my new day job in education? Um, you know, certainly the NDS has some very specific uh, you know, challenges that it lays out for uh, development of human capital. And certainly it's about you know, continuing to recruit and, and retain you know, the very best young Americans uh, to, to serve in our military, uh, but also to make sure that we recognize that uh, you know, developing that talent and, and being able to unleash creativity and innovation is gonna be key to maintaining our technological advantages. Interestingly, that third sub bullet, you know, PME has stagnated. So uh, I was fortunate to have, be, because I'm fortunate to have such talented folks on my faculty, uh, a couple of them got uh, uh, seconded to uh, Secretary Mattis to actually help him write the defense strategy. So uh, I, I've got a little inside baseball into how this all came together. And uh, that particular bullet there, that professional military education has stagnated, um, that wasn't in the draft that uh, they provided to Secretary Mattis. That, that came out of his office with his green ink and his handwriting um, as a challenge. And, you know, in, in I, I had the opportunity to, to, uh, to, to, to chat with Secretary Mattis, uh, you know, asking, hey, is there something specific you, you had in mind towards, uh, towards NDU? Um, and uh, uh, that, that, was, uh, that was not the case. 
Uh, but as a, as a general uh, observation, uh, I'd have to say that's probably true because of course, you know, I've got, uh, you know, great talented faculty who are very proud of, of the programs uh, that they, they deliver. Uh, but when I kind of, you know, laid this out to them, uh, what do you suppose would be a typical academic response? Well, uh, and we you need not have a show of hands here. Uh, Tad is probably already reading my mind. Typical academic response is, well, you know, Admiral, clearly he's, he must be talking about Leavenworth or Newport. He's not talking about us. You know, we're, 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 we're still cutting edge and relevant. Uh, so, you know, we've had to kind of challenge ourselves to, uh, to prove that assumption uh, in ways that frankly, I think is, is, is making us better. Um, and uh, like you saw in our mission statement, um, you know, we are not just delivering academics, but we are trying to emphasize leadership, mission command, independence of action, um, because you know, fundamentally we exist to educate joint warfighters. I'm very, I mean, we do that better because of the foreign service officers, the international you know, students that we have, uh, but you know, we don't exist to make them make the State Department student a better foreign service officer, except through better appreciation of what, you know, all of these participants in the national security environment can, can bring to bear. And then uh, that last piece, uh, strategic asset to build trust and interoperability. This again goes to that relationships piece that I was referring to. And of course, relationships are built in our classrooms by bringing together a lot of diverse perspectives. Uh, but I think as well that there's uh, a lot that we can do in institutional exchanges with our partner organizations, uh, you know, other defense universities and other nations. Next. All right. Um, and then, you know, additionally, um, you know, with Secretary of Defense Esper, um, you know, he has you know, challenged us even more so to make sure that we're, you know, keenly focused on great power competition in general, in China, in, on China in particular. Um, he certainly wants us to uh, help develop on our students an appreciation uh, for the impacts that uh, disruptive technology can have. So if we have a security strategy, um, and it uh, relies upon some fundamental assumption and then some technological breakthrough undermines that assumption. Well, every good planner knows if your planning assumption is invalid, then you no longer have a valid plan. You have to go back to the drawing board. Uh, but of course, the challenge with that is that as Americans, we know that our, uh, our uh, success at strategic forecasting is just about 100%. Yeah, you know, we'll get it wrong just about 100% of the time. Particularly, you know, the more narrowly we try and predict uh, and and bet on a horse, is it going to be AI, machine learning, hypersonics? Yeah, so we we are not in the business of trying to you know make our students technologists, uh, nor to bet on what that breakthrough is going to be. Uh, we're in the business of trying to develop in them in them a healthy skepticism and the. Uh, kind of the, uh, the framework of assessment uh, to always be surveilling the environment and, and trying to anticipate what the impact of a breakthrough would be, uh, either such that you know, we can take advantage of it in our strategies or we can defend it against it if, uh, if it should be a breakthrough that an opponent can take advantage of. And then because of this importance of uh, developing relationships um, and using PME as an asset, uh, to build partnerships, uh, the secretary has has challenges to increase our number of international students uh, here over the next few years. And then uh, just uh, this spring in May, um, for the first time ever, uh, all of the joint chiefs of staff, all service chiefs and the chairman uh, came to, and vice chairman came together and they approved a joint vision and guidance document for professional military education and talent management. Now, let me tell you what's so groundbreaking about that. Just about every chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff issues a vision for professional military education. And, uh, but let's, let's consider, you know, what is the role of the chairman in this enterprise? Uh, he provides learning outcomes to uh, uh, education institutions. Um, uh, and he provides best military advice to the Secretary of Defense and the President. Uh, but he has no directive authority. So if I'm a service chief, I can look at a chairman vision on JPME and say, that's interesting. Uh, 
but then I'm going to make service decisions about, you know, you know, who goes to what education, to what job, at what time in their career. This is now the first time that it's all the Joint Chiefs agreeing on a vision for education and explicitly linking it to the talent management process. Because uh, as Bruce uh, mentioned uh, in my overly long and overly generous introduction from my biography, uh, I'm a recovering detailer. And when I was a detailer, the uh, last thing I wanted to do was have to take one of my top uh, officers and send them to residential education because, you know, I had submarine war rooms that needed to be filled. Uh, now, as a university president, I want all those best warfighters here on campus uh, getting educated to be uh, better strategic leaders. So it, it explicitly links the distribution, the personnel system and the education system in ways that has never been done before. So uh, it'll, uh, it'll be interesting to see if it stands the test of time, but, it, but, it, you know, the, but the start is getting a table slap that, uh, that this is uh, an important linkage uh, that they're all in agreement on. Uh, next slide. Um, and then what does that mean for the Navy's professional military education system? Um, so Navy has issued its own, uh, you know, new revised education strategy, uh, but fundamentally it, it still has many of the same elements that uh, just as you see right here. So next. And so uh, as you see, uh, uh, Navy issued its education for sea power strategy. And what you see on here is just some uh, a highlight of some of the things that have changed or are changing. Uh, in response to this uh, appreciation, both internal to Navy and internal to the Joint Force, uh, that education matters. And, and, and why is it that education matters? Well, uh, we've already talked about uh, you know, how uh, our technological advantage is being challenged uh, increasingly by you know, nations that are you know, choosing to try and find some competitive or asymmetric advantage. Um, and uh, presuming a technological advantage is not our birthright, as I mentioned before. And so our job at NDU is to try and uh, create an intellectual advantage uh, that can go along with our technological advantage so that we can always, even if we got to a point where technologies were the same, uh, we would be able to fight and win because we get outthink the competitor. Next slide. Um, and again, more, more steps being done. So uh, within the Navy now, we are actually, uh, uh, when uh, John Richardson was a CNO, he directed the Navy would move to a practice just like Army, Air Force, and Marine Corps have done for decades, uh, which is to actually uh, screen officers for assignment to residential education opportunities. Uh, I know when I was a detailer that uh, it, was, it was kind of a pickup game. Um, and uh, so that's, that's pretty significant. Um, you know, I think most uh, promotion board precepts have always talked about education. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what new language goes in now. Uh, but uh, anybody who graduated from a residential PME knows that Navy fit reps were always not observed fit reps uh, for this period of time. Uh, you know, the direction is to move towards um, uh, making those observed fit reps. So your academic performance matters in ways that are going to be documented on your fit rep and that's going to matter to a, uh, to a selection board. Next slide. Uh, and then again, uh, Navy is moving towards its own university system. Um, and as you can see there in yellow, uh, you know, one of the, one of the challenges, one of the, the imperatives for linking of PME with the personnel system is uh, if we're really going to say that education matters and we want all of our best officers to be students, then those best officers are going to also deserve having our best officers as faculty. Um, and in years past, particularly, you know, um, uh, you know, in 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 an era where we might not have valued it as much, um, uh, much uh, much 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 uh, more challenging for uh, our military officers assigned to faculty positions uh, to remain upwardly mobile and in contention to, for for flag. Next slide. And uh, you know the N seven is a is a new uh, directorate on the Joint Staff created last year earlier this year uh, with responsibility for implementing this uh, Navy education vision. 
Next slide. All right, and uh, this is my last slide. So uh, this, this is the uh, yeah, same slide I had before, but just kind of in summary. What does all this mean for our submarine force? Uh, you know, this is, this is an awfully exciting time to be in our Navy. An exciting, it's an exciting time to be a submariner. Uh, the, the elements of that national security strategy, that national defense strategy, I mean, they are just describing what really is, it's a maritime strategy. Uh, it calls for forward deployed operations. It calls for, calls for dynamic force employment, which basically means you get underway and the adversary doesn't know where you're going to pop up. Um, you know, these are things that you know, the Navy and the submarine force, we've been doing for as long as we've been around. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, it's interesting that the debate, the discussion on the Hill again this season is, hey, is budget allocations of one third, one third, one third, Army, Navy, Army Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, is that really serving the national interest? Uh, if in fact there's um, uh, recognition that, that uh, you know, competition is increasingly in the maritime domain, then and then it may be that the, the, the greatest investment in force structure in acquisition and readiness uh, needs to be maritime. And obviously that's gonna be decided way above my pay grade. So with that, um, I, uh, I apologize. I, I probably spent longer uh, telling some stories than I intended, but I'd be happy to talk about whatever it is that you all would like to talk about. Over to y'all. Thank you, Admiral. Let me, uh, let's see, I think we got, See, does anybody have a question that they want to ask the Admiral? Yeah, right, well, I can read. Yeah, if you want, I can just read what I see here in the chat. So Bob Mahan uh, asked about uh, you know, uh, referring to the uh, uh, you know the, the president re recently making a statement about uh, uh, diversity education in uh, the federal government. Uh, and, uh, you know, all I can say is that, uh, you know, we, we don't teach, uh, you know, anything that uh, uh, we, we would certainly consider divisive. So we're uh, eagerly awaiting to see uh, what specific, uh, uh, you know, guidance might come to us uh, in operationalizing the president's direction through uh, the Department of Defense. So, uh, but, you know, we, we fully embrace and, uh, and uh, yeah, just yeah, that, that diversity of perspective that, I, that I've been talking about throughout uh, this last 40 minutes, uh, it is not just about, uh, you know, your parent organization, you know, Army, Navy, Air Force, state, defense, treasury, you know, international partners. It's also about race, color, creed, you know, geographic region, socioeconomic background, I mean, all those things. Uh, you know, that contribute to uh, the ability to challenge paradigms and, and uh, to try and find creative solutions. Um, and that, that is inherent to our uh, pedagogy. So we, we embrace it. Okay, Ralph, I think you had a question. You wanna go ahead and unmute and ask it? Sure, sure. thanks Admiral. Um, I certainly enjoyed my time at the National War College in 1991, and as a submariner, was surprised to be assigned to the international military staff in Brussels. And at the time, NATO and its alliances were very strongly and well perceived by what was going on in Washington and the world. Now, in the current environment where alliances are being challenged, I guess my question is, how is NATO and alliance relationships taught at NDU. Yeah, well, again, I think it's, uh, so thanks for that, Ralph. I think they're taught very much in line with, um, you know, kind of the, uh, the discussion that we've already had. Uh, the national defense strategy is explicit in talking about the value of relationships, about the values of friends, allies, and partners. And in education, uh, as I pointed out, uh, he has a specific line in the NDS about using education as a means of developing those relationships. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, it's, it, it, again, it's, it's, it's part of our uh, designed demographic, it's part of our pedagogy, um, and, uh, and certainly, uh, you know, what we see among our student interactions is, you know, not just NATO, but, you know, students from around the world, um, you know, we, we can have, they can have 
uh, discussions on our campus that they could never have back home. Particularly, you know, when you, you know, when you walk into the seminar and you find, uh, you know, it's the Israeli, the Lebanese, the Saudi, and the and the Kuwaiti who are, you know, arguing about something. Uh, but you know, the same goes for you know any part of the world where there's you know tension across a across a border. Um, and so, um, you know, we think that um, you know those. Uh, it, it's a we, we think it's important here in our classrooms, uh, but like I said, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the relationships that are built in our classrooms uh, pretty naturally segue leverage and can be leveraged you know, outside the classroom and for years beyond graduation, uh, which is essential because the ways in which you know, America and our friends, partners and allies you know, work together on common security challenges, they are ways that are increasingly Joint and interagency and international, uh, yeah. So uh, it, it's it's a fundamental part of our not just our curriculum, but uh, you know, the what we teach, but also the how we teach. Thank you, Admiral uh, Jeff Fishbeck. I think you had a couple of questions. You want to go ahead and ask those and mute and ask those. Yeah. So tell you what, I'll just if you don't mind, Bruce, I'll just read. And Jeff, good to oh, see. Okay. You. Yeah, Jeff, good to see you on the net as well again. Uh, so ICAF is one of my five colleges, and uh, um, yeah, I didn't uh, I didn't take the time to to list them all, but uh, um, in fact, uh, if you want, uh, Bruce, if you want to slide slip down into my backup slides, you can just kind of page through on them, uh, and then people who get tired of listening to me have something to read. Uh, but uh, I just got a, a quick summary of the five colleges. But it's a it's the National War College. Uh, ICAF is the Industrial College. Uh, it's not, it's been renamed as the Eisenhower School. Uh, so National War College is about teaching national security strategy. Uh, Eisenhower is about, you know, how government, military, and industry work together to develop the resources to execute a security strategy. I've got a College of Information in Cyberspace that looks at security strategy through the lens of information in cyber, uh, and a College of Irregular Warfare. Um, and then uh, I've got the Staff College uh, down in Norfolk. Uh, and again, all of them uh, deliver a JPME curriculum and uh, all of them deliver a, uh, a master's degree, a unique master's degree. And then Jeff, you're also, also asking about uh, where do our students come from? Uh, that is you know, reviewed every year and it's very much aligned with the uh, combatant commanders, uh, you know, security um, cooperation priorities. So, um, uh, you know, so I have never had a Chinese student here, uh, but back in the uh, late 90s, uh, I did have Russian students, uh, but we don't anymore. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, you know, indicating again how, how responsive this is, you know, three years ago, the largest, so you do the math, I got about 120 international students, you call it roughly 60 countries. So, you know, uh, a lot of, na most nations will send just one student. Uh, there'll be then, you know, a handful that send two or more and a very small handful, like, you know, literally handful uh, might have more than two students. Uh, so uh, just three years ago, my largest student constituency was uh, Pakistani students. Huh. And then three years, and I, I think we had four Pakistani students. And then three years ago, uh, the administration decided we were unsatisfied with Pakistan's uh, you know, contributions to the war on terror. And so we eliminated uh, our funding for Pakistani students. And so then uh, that next year, I had zero Pakistani students. So that, again, is just a, an example that it's, uh, uh, it, it very much aligns with uh, uh, US government uh, and Department of Defense uh, strategic priorities. Um, let's Thank see. You. Yep, you bet, Jeff. Uh, let's see. And uh, Dr. Lawrence asks about more lethal. What is change? Oh, what have we changed? Yeah, how do we engender these attributes? Um, well, uh, uh, you know, greater ingenuity. Well, first off, um, most important thing probably is um, you know, kind of in our strategic plan, Tad. Um, uh, trying to uh, force ourselves to answer this one question. What is it that every NDU graduate needs to know and needs to be able to contribute? Because again, I've got five colleges, five master's degrees programs, uh, you know, a thousand uh, graduates of the 10 week program, you know, et cetera. 
yet all of them, when they earn that JPME2 credit, they're going to go fill a billet, a joint billet, a billet which is on the joint duty assignment list. And the joint duty assignment list is agnostic as to where they come from. So, you know, a billet at Cyber Command, for example, does not is not reserved to be filled by a graduate of my cyber college or a billet at special ops command is not reserved for a graduate of my college of irregular warfare. You know, a, a joint billet is a joint billet and a joint grad is a joint grad. And so, you know, we challenge ourselves to think a little bit more holistically and move away from thinking about, you know, a niche, a stovepipe or a domain and more about, hey, what does everybody need to know? So we re-wickered our core curriculum uh, this last year to try and ensure a more, again, ecumenical uh, approach to such that every student is getting some, uh, some appreciation of, of all domains, you know, air, land, sea, cyber, information, and, and you know, modes, you know, types of conflict like irregular warfare. Um, so that you know, every student hopefully is able to get that appreciation of the threats and opportunities, not only in all domains, but across, but in the seams between all domains. So that's probably the most important thing. And then we, uh, we also, um, you know, as, as I'm sure everybody who's an educator appreciates, it's really easy to add stuff to curriculum. It's really hard to take stuff out. Uh, and so we really forced ourselves to disaggregate everything and then re-aggregate it in ways that, again, we thought were um, you know, prioritizing um, you know, this appreciation of, of the scenes. All right, uh, Charlie, let's see. Uh, do we send many or any of our students? Yes, we do uh, send US students to the uh, our counterpart organizations overseas as well. Um, and typically those are reciprocal relationships. So, uh, you know, they always want our students. We typically say, okay, well then we want your students as well. If an uh, institution uh, overseas was unwilling to accept our students, we might choose to be unwilling to accept theirs. That again is where the, uh, you know, the department, the, the, uh, the joint staff, the COCOMs, they get involved at helping us to, uh, to uh, apportion our, our student seats. Uh, let's see, Ed Seal, yep, Ed, good to see you again too. Um, change the deterrence triad away. I guess I don't, I'm not sure I understand your question, Ed. The, uh, I mean, it's still a triad, clearly. All legs of the triad are, are in need of modernization. Uh, there are efforts underway to modernize all the legs of the triad. Uh, and, and yes, it is also true that the, the, the boomer uh, leg remains the most survivable. So if you want to type in uh, amplification, Ed, I can come back to you. Uh, Charlie, back to you again. Uh, yes, we do have reunions. So every year we do a reunion. Um, um, and they're primarily focused, I, I have to confess, on... So uh, for the NDU broadly, our reunions are primarily focused on trying to maintain our relationships with our international students. And so they're really kind of geared and focused that way. What I mean by that is that, you know, we will uh, convene a regional alumni symposium uh, at uh, every year. We'll do it in a different part of the world. So uh, my first year here, we uh, uh, and, and then we'll do one here in, in Washington. So my first year here, uh, we did it in Washington. My next, the next year we did it in Morocco, uh, partnering with Africa Command. And, and again, these are not just uh, uh, you know, reunions. These, you know, we design an academic program. We try and leverage these folks uh, for the experiences that they have. Uh, and, and again, try and put them to tasks and wicked problems that are identified by the COCOM. So we partner with Africa Command for a Morocco symposium that primarily brought in our African alumni. Uh, last year, we, uh, it was partnering with UCOM for an event that uh, uh, we, and, the, and I'm sorry, and the themes then are aligned with that. So in Morocco, it was all uh, countering uh, violent extremist groups. Uh, uh, last year, uh, we were in Estonia uh, partnering with UCOM and it was all about hybrid warfare, uh, information operations, you know, et cetera. This year we were going to Australia, but you know, COVID has unfortunately gotten in the way. Um, the, otherwise, the reunions are typically run by, uh, by the individual colleges. So uh, War College kind of organizes its alumni events, uh, Eisenhower, you know, similarly. 
Um, all right, Al Standish, go Gophers. Thank you for that. And how is the pandemic affecting the educational environment? Uh, dramatically. So in March, uh, we sent uh, you know, all of our students and faculty home and uh, discovered uh, whose internet access and bandwidth was adequate and whose was inadequate. So uh, we've been basically teaching virtually uh, since March. So we concluded last academic year that way. Um, we uh, graduated everybody virtually. Uh, our convocation this year was uh, virtual and we're still teaching virtual. Now, uh, you know, here in DC, um, positive transmission rate is actually pretty low. It's uh, you know, 1.5%. You know, Virginia, Maryland, they're hovering right around 5%. Um, so I, I'm not banning people from our campus, but you know, if a faculty member, if a dean you know, wants to you know, gather together their students uh, and can make a credible case to the provost that uh, you know, there's a reason uh, to bring people together physically, you know, even masked and six feet apart, you know, we can do that. But you know, what we're finding is that uh, uh, we can you know, have still the same robust Socratic discussions you know, virtually that, uh, that we would prefer to have physically. Um, and, and of course, I, I uh, acknowledged, I admitted and confessed right up front that uh, you know, I did not come here because I'm a professional ad, uh, you know, academic. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, just another uh, uh, knucklehead submariner. Um, but, uh, and so I got here and I'm kind of looking around and you know, walking the deck plates like uh, most of us do. And just asking, hey, you know, this whole distance education thing, isn't this kind of a thing? You know, what, what do we do about that? And, uh, you know, I'd get kind of these, you know, sympathetic, uh, you know, uh, nods and, you know, pat, you know, hypothetically being patted on the head. Oh, Admiral, you just don't understand how we do things here. Uh, and certainly, you know, Socratic method, if we had our choice, we'd all be sitting around an open fire on the ground wearing togas. Uh, but, you know, COVID has created a, a new dynamic for us and, and we've responded. I think, uh, I think we've all been surprised to discover uh, that we can still accomplish the mission. I mean, we do it differently, uh, but we can get the mission done. And so it's gonna be very interesting, you know, when we become post COVID, um, you know, how we integrate these, the lessons we're learning now uh, in ways that I think will make us more effective. Okay, I think I've uh, run out of, oh, okay, Ed, let's see. Uh, 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 we condense the Yeah, uh, I think, uh, so I remember that, that uh, hearing about the work of the GSI, Ed, GSI got disbanded, I think, uh, when I got out to Stratcom in 2010. I'm sure it wasn't for a uh, lack of good ideas, but uh, no, I've not, I've not heard any further discussion on that. Okay, and then Charlie, security implications of uh, teaching around the world. Well, our curriculum is almost entirely, you know, unclassified. Um, you know, and, and fortunately, I've got a chief information officer who's, uh, you know, got our network defenses, you know, pretty robust. But again, we, we don't have any, uh, you know, national security secrets at risk uh, as we deliver our curriculum. Um, but you know, we have the, but 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 obviously, you know, net, any network can be hacked. So uh, we we try and mitigate those risks. And uh, you know, but just like every other you know, academic institution uh, uh, across the nation, and for that matter, around the world. Okay, Admiral, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us. I think we all enjoyed it uh, uh, a lot. Uh, Let's see, uh, we do have a gift for you, which I believe Charlie dropped in the mail yesterday. Just a quick shot. Uh, it's a set of uh, coasters from Point Loma to re uh, remind you of uh, being in San Diego over the years. Fabulous, thank you. Yes, and so I uh, hope the rest of uh, your and Jul Julie's time there in uh, DC goes pleasantly. Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate the opportunity. Good to see so many familiar faces on the net. Um, I'll, uh, I'll uh, give you the warn or that uh, you know, this is probably going to be the last time you're going to be able to uh, avail yourself of me in uniform. Um, I uh, just found out today that uh, uh, the president has uh, nominated my relief. Uh, so uh, uh, you know, sometime in the next few months, uh, you know, I'll uh, I'll have to follow where all of you have so bravely tread in trying to figure out what I want to be when I grew up. So uh, ah. uh, I, I may be calling asking for advice. Well, feel free and uh, good luck on your transition whenever it occurs. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks again, everybody. Appreciate your time.
Uh, just a couple of last minute items, upcoming events of interest. Fleet Week in San Diego will be November 9th through the 15th. And we have forwarded information detailing these events out to the membership. And again, our next Zoom meeting will be on Tuesday, November 10th. And our speaker will be Vice Admiral Daryl Cottle, ComSub4. And details will be in the November newsletter. Uh, if there are no further announcements or business, then we are adjourned. Thank you very much for attending today.